But it turns out that science and spirituality certainly can go hand in hand and that science is a lens and we can point it at a great host of questions, including the impact of lived spirituality in the human life course, or perhaps the origins or etiology of lived spirituality. Hello, and welcome to the Psychology Podcast. Today, we welcome Dr. Lisa Miller, the founder and director of the Spirituality Mind Body Institute. Her innovative research has been published in more than 100 peer review articles in leading journals, and she is the New York Times bestselling author of The Spiritual Child and most recently, The Awakened Brain. In this chat today, we mostly focused on The Awakened Brain. And what I really like about Lisa is that she's a really nice combination of rigorous scientist and a really spiritual person herself. We had a really nice chat that was personal and it felt like talking to an old friend. I also like how we nerded out over the statistics and all the little nuances of this emerging science of transcendence and spirituality. She's a real pioneer in the field and it's my real great delight to bring her to this audience. So without further ado, I would like to introduce you to Dr. Lisa Miller. Well, Dr. Lisa Miller, it's so delightful to have you on the Psychology Podcast. It's so great to be here, Scott. Thank you for including me, including the Awakened Brain. I've so enjoyed following your work, and I think we are transcendent first cousins. I think so, too. I'll take that. I really like that. I've been really enjoying your work and and reading in your latest book, reading your journey um, to such a such detail. <laughs> it was very. It was read like more like a novel than a a science book, you know. So well, that so, was really fun. You know, I actually learned that from my students that, you know, oftentimes in the first 10 years of my 20 years at Columbia teaching, mm. I would teach about things and then I'd ask everyone in the class what they thought. And one day I was going through my course reviews and I said, great class, loved it. But, you know, you ask us what we think, but what does Dr. Miller think? Mm. And it dawned on me that I think there's a culture within science of don't look at the man behind the curtain or don't look at the woman behind the curtain in the Wizard of Oz, that somehow, mm. you know, even the way that we write is in the distant third person. So it seemed to me that to really write a book about spiritual experience was to be behind the curtain and talk about the scientist as walking a journey in life. Yeah, for sure. And you make it dramatic as well in, in your storytelling. Something surprised me, though. You had this dramatic story about how um, you were – and I loved your enthusiasm. First of all, I loved the enthusiasm where you're like, I was, I couldn't wait to see the brain scan results. I couldn't wait. The high spiritual brain was healthier and more robust than the low spiritual brain, and the high spiritual brain was thicker and stronger in exactly the same regions that weaken and wither in depressed brains. And you're excited, as you should have been, and you had some cynic or someone who and he was like, oh, you were right, doctor. <laughs> the whole thing was so dramatic. But then you said one thing. You said, you know, you said, this isn't what we expected to see. Why isn't that what you expected to see? That's why you went into the whole field, right? Is to, because you believed in the power of spirituality. That's why so I didn't understand that line at all. Well, it's probably, I think what was meant was that it's not what the team at large had expected to see. But you believed in it. Absolutely. Yes. 100%. Yes, yes. I was not surprised, although I wasn't surprised by the direction of the findings. I wasn't surprised that there were indeed robust neural correlates of spiritual awareness and that those should be neuroprotective against the next bout of depression. That I could see in the other levels of analysis through the epidemiologic data, through the clinical course data, and it had been my experience. So I, and truthfully, Scott, I, there had been also a, a sort of premonition that I had about that. But mm. the team, I think, was quite surprised. Um, so that's what was meant there by the we. Um, that said, it was so much more um, vivid and magnificent than I yeah. had even sensed. So even in science, I don't know if you've had these moments where you have a intuitive sense of where things may be going and you've yet to see the results and they could point in either direction, but you do have a sense. This was sort of a hundredfold more magnificent. And it was one of those moments where I think of science as a form of witness, you know, just as wow. in a church or a temple, someone can stand up and in the first person give witness. We look at the chorus of human experience and it was a witness as to who we really are. And it was, it was a sacred moment in my life. 
Yeah, it certainly was. And I, I got chills just reading the story for you, you know, because it is very exciting and it's very important to the field. Um, but I was just thinking like, but Dr. Mo, you've been saying this since, you know, the, the days you were hanging out with Marty taking walks with him. So I was like, you sure, surely you weren't surprised. But no, thank you for that clarification. That makes a lot of sense to me. Sometimes some things are so... Uh, feel so obvious to me like that of course they're going to find this xyz and i'm shocked that other people in the field are like cynical about it. they're like i don't know are you sure that hypothesis is sound and you're like just feel it you know it's true <laughs> well yeah i mean you've been absolutely a fellow pathbreaker and you know i oh, guess that's, that's very it, kind of you to say it, it's very true and my view is that all of the sort of skepticism and even at times um you know unexamined um, unscientifically founded sort of poo-pooing, that just means the work needs to get done. Um, so we don't do philosophical psychology, we do empirical psychology, and the proof is in the numbers. And that is the best friend of someone who is a weed whacker and a pathbreaker like yourself. You know, that that is empiricism is our friend. Every mystic needs a little empiricism. I love that. I really do love that. Okay, so we started with the dramatic moment. Let's let's rewind a little bit and let's go back to your days at University of Pennsylvania. You crossed paths through there too, didn't you? At some point, I did. I did. I ran the Imagination Institute with Martin Seligman. <laughs> yeah, that's so cool. I love it. So when you were with working with Marty, were you his grad student in like PhD? Right. Wow. So I was a doctoral student in clinical psychology, and it was right at the time that Marty was starting to imagine the positive psychology movement. And it was so interesting, wow. as you know Marty so well, Martin Seligman was, as an undergraduate, when he was at Princeton, a philosophy major. And he was really kind of a classic psychologist in that he drew out of Aristotelian values and philosophy, mm -hmm. really the first template for the positive psychology movement. And others have gone their own direction since then, but he was really a pathbreaker and um, we'd speak, we'd have long, long walks where we'd talk and imagine, and um, we agreed on many things, but there was one point where I, I love Marty as, as a mentor, as a figure who I admire, as a uncle figure, um, but we never agreed on what spirituality is. And Marty at the time thought that it was sort of the epiphenomenal, the feeling you get from right action in a true Aristotelian sense. Mm. And you know, since then, that was the 90s, right? mm. we now have buckets full of science. We have MRI studies showing the neural correlates of spiritual awareness. We have long-term clinical course studies showing it is a pathway to renewal, not just back to baseline, but that we are made bigger inside when we have a spiritual response to trauma, post-traumatic spiritual growth. So spirituality as an empirical uh, area of focus has really burgeoned in the past 25 years. Um, but I'll tell you, Marty showed me what a scientist is. And Marty's idea was, he said, if you're going to be a scientist who reads or a scientist who writes, better be the scientist who writes. Have imagination, read outside the field, and always see how things could be overturned to be better. You know, he was such a role model for me. I love that. Yeah, and a role model for many people, for sure. But I love this this conversation you had with him because it really is a precursor to your modern day uh, two modes sort of mm -hmm. distinction between achieving awareness and awakened awareness, but that that goes back to those conversations you had with him, where he was really Marty loves control. <laughs> Let's be honest, understanding how we can have control, how we can have hope, right? How we can have, you know, th these are these are he loves those things. But you you came on, you're like, I think maybe there is a different motive. That's all nice. That's all nice. I'm not against control, but maybe there's a different mode of consciousness that's more vast and meaning oriented and loving and what well, i love that you did this i love that you said this i love that you had these ideas because you're a path breaker in the field because of that so can you take us back to these these conversations you have with marty about this it was so wonderful so we would walk for hours you know he was so generous to his mm. mentees, as you know having yeah, sure. professional colleagues with them yeah. and we would walk for hours um and we sort of think things through. And a model that I've been working with is that there's different modes of consciousness that we can effectively put our hand on the gear shift as if it were a stick shift car mm -hmm. and move by choice, which is a very Marty idea that we can move by choice between levels of perception. Yes. Marty idea. He gave that to the field with learned 
optimism, you know, learned helplessness, right? It's a choice. So at the time though, the model I had imagined was, and again, I love scientific imagination. I tell my students it's the most important skill you can have. I love that. The, the scientific imagination had brought forth that there's a mode of work that I called sort of um, Dionysian, and it's and it was you know, being in the flow, and and it was kind of a little bit like Cheek Sent Mahai, and it was being in the, and then there was the view that there was an an Apollonian state where you had a clarity and you were hands-on and you were a doer. Um, it's what grew into achieving awareness in the awakened brain. Yeah. But then there was this other mode of experience that I called at the time the Olympian state, where we stand on top of a mountain and there's tremendous perspective and that little nagging thing falls in its place along the landscape and we're aware of the highest truth. And my word is God, and I saw it as a transcendent spiritual state in which we received inspiration. Whereas at the Apollonian level, what I call the achieving level, we put A and B and C together. And it is a very important pursuit that we strategize about our lives. We tactically figure out where we're going. We prepare ourselves. We go to school and gain certain skills and information. But to really have a breakthrough in life. And I mean, yes, creatively, yes, innovatively in our work, but even more importantly in our next step as a soul on earth, what are we going to do with ourselves? That type of breakthrough came, I felt the most powerful use of our brain was receptive. It came as a catch in the catcher's mitt. It was inspired, like the touch on the Sistine Chapel. And that form, what I called at the time Olympian, I've come to call awakened awareness because it is awakening to something real. You know, I think that psychology very often stops with the human as a closed system, the hermetic human. And oh, yeah. it feels as if we are um, in connection with something more. And I'm saying in the awakened brain that we can identify the neural correlates of transcendent awareness. But I want to go even further and draw on sister and brother areas of inquiry in the consciousness studies work and say, we are perceiving something real. That inspiration came from somewhere. So psychology too often stops. I think they will, we will say, I am grateful. But we won't say, I'm grateful to whom? It could be a person. It could be from our higher power. The object of the preposition is missing. And so... I am grateful to God. I'm grateful to my higher power. I'm grateful to the source of all life. To whom am I grateful for this magnificent mm -hmm. life? Um, because that, I feel, sets us up to be in dialogue with the source of life. That sets us up to be able to not just control our path and get what we want, but really be surprised, really be inspired, really go somewhere we didn't think we'd go. And that, it, wow, it even turns out to be better than my wildest dreams. Wow, that's very poetic. And did you feel this? Uh, is this like how did this come to you? These ideas? Have you had a lot of these kinds of spiritual experiences as a kid, even in undergraduate? You know, what are the moments that led up to this revelation in grad school? Um, yes, I think like every child, um, my first book was called The Spiritual Child, and it was on the scientific mm. basis that says we are innately spiritual beings. Mm. So just as we're born physical and emotional and cognitive beings, we are inherently spiritual beings. And that indeed, that body of science mirrors my experience as a child. So as a child, I can remember, Scott, I can remember, um, you know, being in dialogue with God, who Everyone, one God, many names, higher power, Jesus, the universe, force, you know, source. But I remember that felt experience. Could you? Yes. There, there were moments like when I was uh, scared uh, of flying and I was on the airplane and, uh, and I heard a voice saying, just relax, you'll be fine. I trust me. And those kinds of moments. That's so moving. Yes. And, it, and that voice, when, when I say I saw something, or I heard something, the way I express it is it was absolutely clear and it was in my mind's eye. I didn't think the guy next to me was saying that. Right. There's right. a perception and it is a powerful, godly inspired gift. Um, and it comes in with and lands with a sense of knowing that that's exactly what it is. Mm -hmm. 
So you were a child and you knew that. Yeah, yeah, for sure. Even uh, yeah, uh, in college as well, um, helped me get over my fear of flying. <laughs> In college, on an airplane as well, or yeah, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Mostly college, not not even as a as a kid, I didn't fly too much, but yeah. So th- this is so um, this is so interesting. You're such an interesting sort of hybrid model of scientist and spiritual seeker, and obviously you study the science of spirituality. But but not all scientists who study the science of spirituality are particularly spiritual themselves. So it, it doesn't necessarily come for the long for the ride. You know, so you're an interesting hybrid model. So how do you? <laughs> so that's thank you, Scott. So I see science as a form of witness, right? We can stand up one by one in a temple or a mosque or a church and tell our experience, and it is testimony, it is witness. The chorus of human experience, our study samples, are the voice of us in collective. And in that sense, I see us as scientists as bearing witness. So science for me is a very um, sacred endeavor. I mean, t- is to discover what's true. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. So you are a very you're a truth seeker and a spiritual seeker. Do these things ever contradict each other? And you then you have to kind of find some way of reconciling them. They've never conflicted. They've wow. never conflicted. And well, but I think that's because you know in our 20th century culture, there was a tendency for some folks to say, "I am, I am a scientist." Um, I only believe what can be shown out by science and science simply has not proven spirituality. Mm-hmm. And then on the other hand, there were people who would say, I'm a deeply spiritual person. I don't care if science can't prove this. Science can't tell us everything. Mm-hmm. But it turns out that science and spirituality certainly can go hand in hand and that science is a lens and we can point it at a great host of questions, including the impact of lived spirituality in the human life course, or perhaps the origins or ideology of lived spirituality. And we can even identify the neural seat of spiritual perception and which of all the threads of lived spiritual life are the ones that are really tidal wave changing in our lives. Hmm. So there's a lot of richness. In a way, it, it's, um, it only augments the spiritual path because, because it's this mass witness, this mass testimony. So let's uh, let's unpack some of these findings. These major yeah. you have a lot of over the course of your career, so this may take a couple of days. But um, one finding I want to start off with is this finding that low levels of depressive symptoms were related to high levels of personal devotion. I find that so fascinating. And can you can you tell me how you operationalize the construct personal devotion? Yes, thank you. That, You're welcome. That was, yes, That's my nerdy That's question. I'm so appreciative you read the book. <laughs> you read, oh, I, oh, I have so many notes. You read the references. Yeah, Thank you. Yeah, yeah. Um, so much fun. Okay, yeah. so basically what blew my mind was in 1997, I was a postdoc at Columbia in the medical school. Mm-hmm. And I'd been thinking about spirituality and religion because I saw it in my clients. And it had been part of my own life. And I'd seen how life unfolds differently when there's a spiritual relationship and our family holds a spiritual relationship. So it was very frustrating to look through all of the social sciences and realize that there was within science at that time, 95, 96, effectively a theological debate of how will we as a field of science define spirituality. And, you know, one person said it is absolutely a sense of peace and connection. And the next person would say, no, no, it is that felt sense of um, unity and compassion. And everyone had a different definition, which um, they're certainly in their journey entitled to, but they they were not scientifically derived definitions. So it was just this this gift from heaven. It was just amazing. When I read an article by Ken Kenler that had been published in 1997, and his first article was in the American Journal of Psychiatry. And Ken Kenler at the time was the leading genetic epidemiologist who applied the method of twin studies. Twins raised together, twins raised apart. We can factor out the degree of commonality as a function of genes and environment and see the extent to which any trait is heritable versus environmental norms, okay? And so he'd taken this hammer and hit about everything that psychiatry cared about. He'd hit depression and bipolar and schizophrenia. Schizophrenia, of course, is about 90% heritable. Hmm. And in finding that, of course, debunked the myth that your mother had made you was a schizophrenogenic mother, right? So he was really doing interesting, groundbreaking work by applying 
the twin study model. Well, he finally applied it. Well, he was radically innovative and the field through him finally applied it to spiritual life. And in particular, he using the Virginia twins, he looked at the extent to which heritability or environment accounted for three factors of spiritual life. One was denomination. One was adherence to creed, which he termed personal conservatism, not in the political sense, but in the adherence to one's own tradition. And the third dimension was personal devotion. Now, how had Kendler come to this dimension of personal yeah. devotion? He had used the scale that Kessler, who was first at Michigan and then at Harvard, had developed um, and used it in a way that had never been used before. He took this scale of personal devotion alongside the other two and applied it, basically put the twin study method upon it, around it. Mm -hmm. And does our denomination have anything to do with our genes? No. Does the degree to which we adhere to denomination have anything to do with our genes? Nearly no. But the capacity through which we have a personal sense of connection to our higher power mm. is about the third heritable. So in hair splitting scientific terms, um, in looking at the variance amongst people, one third of the variability amongst us can be attributed to broad heritability, which means for our friends that we are all born with a natural capacity to be in relationship to our higher power. But two thirds environmentally shaped also says that our parents, our pastor, priest, imam, rabbi, our friends by the locker, Dr. J's son, all weigh in to shape this innate capacity. One third heritable, we are naturally spiritual beings. Two thirds environmentally formed. Parents, think about what you're showing and teaching your kids. Because every minute is a living minute of spiritual formation. And that accelerates in adolescence and emerging adulthood. So it, our teenagers are on a quest. Our teenagers are on a hot quest. And it's hardwired and it's foundational to who they'll be the rest of their lives. I have three teenage kids and I watch this. What is my meaning? What is my purpose? Actually, what is the meaning, the purpose? What is the nature of reality? And if there's moments, say sophomore year in college, where we actually don't know if there's any meaning in the universe, hmm. and we really don't know, I mean, skin in the game, that is an existential despair. And it's what I've come to see as developmental depression hmm. that is invitation. It's really the ignition of spiritual emergence in this precious moment of growth with this late adolescence, early adulthood. And it's 50%, you'll love this, longitudinal twin studies show there's a 50% increase in the hair level contribution across middle to late adolescence into emerging adulthood of personal devotion. The items there are, I turn to God for guidance in times of difficulty. When I have a tough decision to make, I ask really, what does my higher power want me to do? It is a dynamic, lived, transcendent relationship where on the plane, you hear the voice of God in your mind's eye. There's a relationship. Two way. Yeah, yeah. Uh, that's a similar pattern uh, as IQ <laughs> in terms of increased heritability as we age. Um, so that's interesting. Yeah, and IQ, as you know, is actually even more heritable, right? Yeah. So that's more yeah. 50, 60% heritable. Um, so, especially as you this, age, it gets up to 80. Yeah. yeah. So, you know, this um, spiritual capacity exists independent of personality. It exists independent. It's very, 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 very tiny associated with IQ, like 0 0.1. Um, it's really, uh, it's, it is, you know, I love the term common sense because mm -hmm. common means we all get it. Well, this is our most magnificent common birthright. Yeah, yeah I'm an individual differences researcher. Um, I, I found quite high correlations between openness to experience and lots of dimensions of self-transcendent experience. I wouldn't say they're uh, non-trivial at all. You know, I would say they're that actually... That is the only dimension of personality. That's it, that's it. yeah. Introversion, extroversion, high, strongly. It happens to be my favorite one. It happens to be my favorite dimension of personality, personally. <laughs> well, because you are innovative. Our creators, our well, scientists, our poets, our shamans, our priests and rabbis, people who are porous and open and take in life. Those who are more open, open systems. It in fact, is the only dimension of personality that goes hand in hand to be open to experience with 
awakening and transcendent awareness. Yeah. And and with harder bumps in life because we fail. Yeah, yeah, definitely, definitely. It it seems like there's a just like a, a constellation of uh, personality variables that are relevant to bring in. Um, I'm going to just mention some more. <laughs> um, absorption seems to we see very we found in our data sets very high correlations um, and uh, highly sensitive uh, people, um, especially the aesthetic appreciation aspects of being highly sensitive, um, tends to be very relevant as well. So, so there. Yes. <laughs> I need to qualify what I said, which was among the big five. Okay, gotcha. So, yeah. Yeah, so yeah. Among the, big five, the big five personality factors that end up in large epidemiological studies, of those, it is only openness to experience. And of course, that goes hand in hand with absorption. What do they correlate? Like 0. 0.6, 0. 0.5? Some yeah, it's it's at least at least sometimes. So the correlation between like with all it depends what facet of self transcendence you're looking at, but it, but with all AWA David Yaden and I found a correlation between like the all experience and openness to experience that was like extraordinarily high, you know. So yeah. that's that's cool. That's always cool. Collaborate. We should collaborate. Hell yes. So do you know? I was gonna say, do you know David Yaden and his work? So I've crossed paths with it. It's beautiful work, you know, because through Marty. Yes. Oh, exactly. Exactly. Because like, I just keep thinking of him when I think of you because like you were, the, you're the OG <laughs> of, you're the OG of working with Marty and, and pioneering this whole field. And then he's David Nadin's the, the, the pioneer and, you know, the young buck pioneer, right? You know what I'm saying? So I just keep thinking of how you all need to, or we all need to. I come from I come from the creativity world into your world. Do you know what I'm saying? Like yeah. I studied creativity for 20 years, then I come into your world through through the root of creativity and how are how are we wired for creativity? And and it, there's a lot of in the whole Venn diagram. There's a lot of overlap between how we're wired for creativity and how we're wired for uh, spirituality. You know, here here, and so that is the muse. That's inspiration. I would say yeah. that's spirit. That is yeah. the Sistine Chapel. Yes, yes, absolutely. And of course, Dr. Keltner's work is very relevant and uh, has made the case that we're wired for spirituality. But uh, this is, you're right, it, it wasn't obvious to the field and there was a lot of pushback on the field for many years. Going back to even my my hero, Abraham Maslow, he kept making that argument over and over that like it's part of hum being human is having these spiritual ways of being and higher, se higher selves. And, you know, people would, Poo poo that in the in the, in the in, within the field in the fifties and sixties. Even though all the hippies in San Francisco embraced it, <laughs> they loved Abraham Maslow. But you know he got a lot of pushback from his academic colleagues. You know, so um, it it just seems so obvious to me though that like it, like, like like who could be cynical about that? <laughs> but I guess it's not. I guess it's not to everyone. Well, I think there's a. Um common 20th century way of thinking that we're moving past we're bridging past that now but it used to sound like this which is um depression is biological addiction is biological spirituality is not biological is that that was the thinking but it turns out there's indeed a broad host of biological correlates that go hand in hand with spirituality and even more foundationally there's a neurosthete of perception that I'm calling the awakened brain that goes hand in hand with spiritual awareness. Yes. yes. So that is kind of an outdated um, perception, but I think what is helpful, like as we move into the 21st century is to perhaps think of body, mind, and soul as one that, you know, then, you know, yes, it is both a spiritual experience. There are biological correlates and there is a, a way in through choice and use of mind. So, I think we're getting to more of a monoist perspective. Now, that doesn't mean biological reductionism. I'm not saying that the brain makes all this stuff. That's kind of the industrial view. The brain makes thoughts just like the conveyor belt makes cars. Um, I think we're moving into a view of the brain in the 21st century that does the brain receive consciousness? Does the brain um, reify consciousness turned into? I mean, why is it that through certain practices, neurons become strong and thick is that the reification of consciousness um so we don't quite know what the brain is or how it works we know patterns that we can observe that go hand in hand with experiences or behaviors but it's such an exciting fascinating time to be a scientist and to be an emerging scientist i 
and our students really have a great moment. Yeah, and I love your students. I love I love like the students at Teachers College uh, in your program. And uh, coming yeah. to the Spirituality Mind Body Institute, they, it's wonderful. Thank you. No, I adored them. them. I just oh my gosh, it's just their enthusiasm and their love to learn about this field. You know, like that's it. We that's what we need is we need apprentice uh, people who do apprenticeships on this topic and then go out there and become the OGs someday themselves, right? That's exactly what we want. <laughs> that's why we're doing this. So it's so exciting when you see so much enthusiasm. Well, they love you and I appreciate your speaking with them. Mm. And you know, they do go out and their lives are lives of service. That mm -hmm. spiritual activists. They yeah. uh, in fact when they convene our students at the Spirituality My Body Institute, they are as close to an ideal society as I've seen. You know, they're very careful to not impute their ideas on others. They're very interested in each each other's journey. Um, it, it's lovely to see the way we can live. And a lot of them are Gen Z and millennials. And I, I think that the roots of uh, spiritual society are strong in Gen Z. I think Gen Z has a de facto way of being non-egotistical, not a closed system, an open system, a, an aware, awake system. Absolutely. And I love the distinction you make between those two kinds of systems. It's beautiful. I want to go a little bit back in your story uh, to your Yale days because my, my office at Yale as a grad student was in the basement uh, next to a water heater. My, my office was. And I and I actually am wondering, well, I I have, did, I, did I have your office? Was I in my your old office? Room, my contemplative room. <laughs> Is that, your water could, heater. Could that be? Could that have been my, we had the same office? <laughs> <laughs> That's incredible. Um, it was meant to be. It was meant to be. You said being with doubt and sadness, questioning what I believed. I had many moments of doubt and sadness in that room too, by the way. Um, beyond, uh, beyond questioning what I believed, I brought with me beyond. Let me try that again. Being with doubt and sadness, questioning what I believed, brought me beyond a one-track intellectual way of be uh, intellectual way of knowing the world and into a felt awareness of life, which eventually returned me to a sense of buoyancy and belonging. So you raised something really interesting there, and that's the, you know the, I think it's relevant to the field of post-traumatic growth. You know that that's uh, that's popping up now. Um, what in what ways can these moments of despair, sadness, contemplation really turbocharge our spiritual, you know, activate those <laughs> spiritual regions of our brain. So I, you know, I think it is so foundational to emerging as an adult. I remember after going through what I've come to see as a developmental depression, um, I realized that the suffering drove me, you know, terrible, like a hard, first of all, it was real depression. I was a sophomore and the word sophomore slump does not do justice to this experience. Mm -hmm. I remember, you know, feeling, oh no, it's coming, it's coming. And just like a you know, shadow figure, this horrible sense of dread would come over me. And I was 19 and then I'd feel terribly anxious. And then I'd wonder, what is the purpose of life? Does God exist? And, and this inquiry um, was really painful. It was really painful. And do we exist? I mean, you know, we're transient. We, we change, our cells change. Um, there's, you know, we're 70% guests, little tiny microbes and, you know, do we even exist? And is there anything fundamental and that is enduring in family or friends or lovers? Is there anything that stays? And it, it was really, you know, taken seriously. What is the existence that we live? What is the purpose written into life or is there any? That process um, was excruciating. And I asked the questions of my head. I would look through data empirically. I would logically play this through. I took uh, just buckets full of classes, philosophy, Nietzsche, the existentialists. And everywhere I went at Yale, I was looking for the answer to the question, what is the meaning of life? Mm -hmm. uh, that's what I'm here for. I'm here for four years to figure out the meaning of life so that I can go live one based on meaning. It was a foundational quest. And I couldn't find it in the way that we were approaching texts at the time in the classroom. We were reading, you know, I went to world religions and we read in this very arm length way, you know, as if we were looking through a foggy mirror. We read about other faith traditions and their history and their figures. But there was 
never an engagement of experience. Uh, let's try a contemplative practice. Let's explore when in your life have you had a felt of sense of guidance that was too unprobabilistic to happen by chance. These down to brass tacks questions about a transcendent reality were never addressed at the level of heart or felt experience phenomenologically. And so I left sophomore year thinking, wow, you know, and I, I looked horrible because there was, you know, I was just weighed down by this. And then that summer, I remember standing on banks of the Gulf of Mexico and seeing light in the water and feeling this euphoric, loving sense. Of course, mm -hmm. God exists. of course, there's love built into the world. Of course, we're held. That journey of nagging with the head, questioning with the head, but only receiving a convincing answer through an inspired moment, a mystical moment, an intuitive moment, a receptive moment, an awakened moment, the catch and our catchers met. That seemed to me to have been the work to figure mm. out that inside of us, we are knowers, right? Mm. Many epistemologies, we are knowers, we are logicians and we are empiricists and we are mystics and we are intuitives. And when we can get all forms of human knowing in dialogue around the table, and the skeptic gets to be there too. Nice. Then we really challenge and discover, challenge and discover. It's what I call quest. Um, so the skeptics at the table, the skeptics, not the bouncer at the door. No one is the bouncer at the door, you know. And I think the problem with um, our opportunity in education is to invite students to the table of human knowing. Nice. Uh, you're, 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 there's something very poetic about your soul <laughs> as well as the, the mind of your science. You. What do you say? Right back at you. No, oh, I did. I've, actually, I've, I have said, I feel like I have a poetic soul. Thank you. Thank you for saying that. I feel seen. I feel seen. Um, can I tell you about a tweet that I wrote the other day? Oh, please. And I know you'll take me seriously. I said, this is going to sound super woo woo, but I've noticed that when my being is infused with the energy and spirit of love, I feel like I'm vibrating more resonantly with the universe. I have a sneaking suspicion that the universe is inherently loving and that heat disrupts that flow. I wrote that and I got, you know, a couple people, like, that doesn't sound scientific. Will you tell me if there's any scientific uh, evidence for any of that? So you are absolutely right. And science mirrors that wisdom that you directly. I'm doing, the, I'm doing the dance. Yep. Here's the science that when we are, particularly when we've come through a road of trials, so, you know, and asked questions and broken through when we're in a deep mm. spiritual sense of connection, when we are awakened to the spirit and then through all life, the brain gives off a certain wavelength as captured by EEG and it gives it off right in the back of our head where many traditions, for instance, the yamaka goes there, right? Posterior back of a yeah, head, yeah. high amplitude alpha is given mm. off. And the more that we have engaged in transcendent awareness, daily spiritual awareness, knowing each other, brother and sister, knowing events as non-random, that is openings and guidance, the more we see life spiritually and live that way, the more that becomes the new normal, the set point. And the more we live that way, the more we give off high amplitude alpha. Mm. To your experience, Scott, High Amplitude Alpha goes by another name in another field, and it's Schumann's resonance. It's the wavelength from the Earth's crust up one mile, all the way around the Earth. Nature, creation, vibrates at the same wavelength as the spiritually engaged brain, which I prefer means what you experienced so immediately, which is we return to oneness. We return to our nature. Nature, we are indeed one with all life, with spirit. That with gives life. So take that, Twitter trolls. <laughs> Listen to Dr. Lisa Miller, scientifically valid what I said. Um, uh, wow, that's so cool. But you said it so beautifully and so accurately, which was you were vibrating with all life. You were indeed part of the oneness of all life. Can I say, I want to send you an article, like not to give you homework, and I don't expect you to necessarily read it, but I want to say an article called, what does, that I wrote called, What Does God Feel Like? I'd love to read that. Tell people where they can find it. Oh, you can just Google uh, my name, Scott Barry Kaufman. What does God feel like? And, and the article should come, show up in Google. We can all read it. 
Like, yeah, I love that. No, absolutely. everyone can read it. Yes, please, please. The research is interesting that, that you're finding because it suggests that that spirituality is a domain general mechanism, and you're distinguishing it from religion, from specific ideologies. So being able to pull apart ideology from the spiritual module that we all share as a human humanity is actually quite revolutionary. I mean, that's that's how many thousands of years of humanity has that no one pulled those things apart. You know, people, how many wars have people fought over, you know, whose spiritual center is getting the right messages and who's getting the wrong ones from which source, you know, as opposed to we all got that part of the brain, you know, so this is revolutionary. There is one spiritual brain and we all have it. Exactly. So the universal language is numbers, right? Wow. It's all the world. And what do we know from science? We know that the capacity for spiritual awareness is our birthright. There is an innate spiritual brain in every one of us. Religion is the gift of our ancestors, our community, the books we read. It is environmentally transmitted. Now, for two-thirds of people in the United States, their natural spirituality is embraced by the environmentally transmitted religious tradition of their family or one which they discover. But the religious tradition that may help support, mold, guide their natural spirituality is a gift of environment. Spirituality is in every one of us. And a third of people in the United States will say, I'm spiritual, but I am not religious. I am spiritually aware in nature when I'm with my family, with music and art, creativity, artists. Yes, yeah. totally, totally. It's a, creating is often a spiritual experience for people, you know, in general. Um, that's, and creating yeah. our lives, right, as you say. And the key to our lives. Uh, yeah, yeah, and absolutely key to our lives, yeah. It's a way of being. Yeah, yes, a way of being. And so, yeah. too, is natural spirituality. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. We're the most powerful part of our brains receptive. Because so many people focus on the doing part of that stuff, you know what I mean? And that's that makes my eyes roll sometimes. <laughs> so, Scott, I want to emphasize a point that you shared. I think it's very important. Mm-hmm. But if one spiritual brain, ergo, religious war is incredibly outdated. And it is such a joy to share this science all around the world yeah. where either religions are not getting along or we don't do religion here or whatever. We all have a spiritual brain. And it is allowing us to return to our nature, which is the open system, the oneness with all life. Yes. Yes. Quotes you saying religious war is outdated. That is the best quote in like the history of humanity. <laughs> you, you just gave me my favorite quote of all of humanity. So no big deal. <laughs> Not willing. That is, that is our fate, right? That yeah, religious yeah. war is outdated. Yes. Yes. So incredible because Um, you know, also like Andrew Newberg's work, I don't know if you've ever collaborated with him, you know, um, and, uh, you know, there's, there's a cadet of Philly also, Philly Philly boy, Philly boy as well. (laughs) Yes. Yes. And I've, I've published papers on him on the, on the creative brain and it's, uh, lots of similar regions and things, um, and some differences and some slight, you know, the default mode network is, um, is it, that's actually an interesting sort of uh, uh, thing I've been trying to reconcile between the creativity literature and the spirituality literature. If you really want to nerd out with me, is that a lot of people in the uh, like the mindfulness world or whatever they, uh, they 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 like treat the default mode network as though it's the enemy, and then in in the creativity world it's considered the best thing since sliced bread, you know. And obviously. Um, you know, it, it, no brain network is all good or all bad at all times and no times, obviously. However, those literatures tend to be separate from each other. And I've been trying to argue that um, there are times when it's profound, uh, quite profound to keep that default mode network active and really dive into uh, your, your self narratives and your meaning making aspects. And then there are times when it's good to transcend it, but it's, but th- it's, not, it's not the enemy. Or, 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 or the angel. Well, I think you put that well. There's different moments in a creative process or a spiritual process. And Thanks. there are times, you know, when I'm speaking about the spiritual brain, I'll say we may want to quiet our brain so that we might then qua- cross the threshold into an awakened state where we receive wow. inspiration. 
if I'm thinking about creativity, there's times to quiet and times where you've got to keep that working on the back burner and bam, then it comes, right? So I think a great project for us all is to sit down and do a mapping yes. of human transcendent experience as a process. I love this. I love this. Just like they've done with the creative process. Yeah, no, that makes so much sense. So much sense. Um, I've been talking to, to researchers in the field who study the neuroscience of like mindfulness, like Judson Brewer, and have tried to put together panels of my creativity colleagues and 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 him discussing how to reconcile these findings. You know, but um, I think that the process model is going to be the best way of thinking about it because and the systems systems way of thinking because I don't like how the field. I, I, this is like my pet peeve. So you're activating my pet peeve right now is how the field tends to be uh, treated, treat as though they're like, it's either all good or all bad at all times. Right. Or no times like the, the psilocybin research, right? Like um, Michael Pollan's book, he, the, the, the whole triumphant narrative of his book is that he quieted the default mode network. And I was like, Oh hell no. <laughs> Why is that like the ultimate in life is that you quieted the default mode network that really like upset me. <laughs> <laughs> because I think that's not the most complex, nuanced narrative we can have about about the neuroscience of it. Do you know what I mean? It makes for a good story, but it doesn't make for a truthful nuance of um, the uh, the importance of that brain network for a full, meaningful life. And so told from the level of experience, there's times to quiet our brain, but then I would say so that we might then receive. So, you know, stop the racket, did the check clear, what did he say to me, you know? Stop the racket so that we then might the, allow the muse to visit, hear God's voice. You know, that notion of a receptive faculty is more than just silence. It's not quiet in the brain. It's a prepared stance in being to receive. Um, so, you know, I, I've been to school, Scott. It's so beautiful where I've seen middle school boys get into a state of what that school called espacio as their receptive transcendent practice. Wow. You know, Seventh grade boy closes his eyes, and what is God telling me now? What is my higher power? Whether it's Jesus, Hashem, Allah, the universe, force, spirit, what is being said to me now? Can we do a practice? Yes. Is that okay? Yeah. Yes, please. Okay. Um, this is a practice. I always honor the teacher to from whom it came. Dr. Gary Weaver was a man who worked with court referred boys. Um, mm that no one else wanted to work with. And the third time that these boys went before the judge, they had a choice of going to grown-up prison or they could go out into the Moab, no. the Utah desert with Dr. Weaver, who loved these boys. These boys had been terribly abused and no longer had a connection to their higher power. There had been spiritual injury. You know, and moral injury is when the world as we know it doesn't hold. Spiritual injury more foundationally is when we feel unworthy before God, or we can no longer connect to our higher power, or we no longer feel open system to all life. So he knew what all the science now, you know, 30 years later mirrors, which is at the heart of trauma is a damaged capacity to be in relationship to God and all life, to no longer system. And he brought these boys into the desert to help, which is what I find so valuable, help renew and reverse their spiritual injuries so that they could grow. Are we going to do a practice? Let's do gonna, it. Sorry. Are we going to do it? <laughs> I just want to know where it came from. You got me exci excited. Okay, let's do it. So I'm going to invite you to clear out your inner space and close your eyes, take seven breaths, and open up your inner space. Sounds like screaming in the background. <laughs> Those are peacocks. On I'm my like, roof. what is that? <laughs> I, I, at the moment, I'm in I'm in Miami, and I live with peacocks. They're fabulous. Incredible. Now we have to start over. I Five. <laughs> okay. I invite you to set before you a table. This is your table. And to your table, you may invite anyone living or deceased, who truly has your best interest in mind. Anyone living or deceased who truly has your best interest in mind. And with them all sitting there, 
Ask them if they love you. And now you may invite your higher self, the part of you that is so much more than what you have or don't have, what you've done or not done, your true eternal higher self. And ask you if you love you. And now finally, you may invite your higher power, whatever word you may know, however you understand your higher power. And ask your higher power if they love you. And now with all of those people sitting there right now, what do they need to share? What do you need to know? What do they need to tell you now? When you're ready, I invite you back. Wow. Amazing. This is your counsel, and they are always there for you. What an incredibly powerful practice. What an incredibly powerful practice. I don't know if I can continue this interview right now. (laughs) I'm going to address you put both feet in and really mm. took the journey, right? You chose to explore that. Um, I will say that this is our birthright. Those are real mm. relationships. Our natural seat of transcendent relationship is loving and holding. It is guiding. Mm. And we are never alone. Oh my gosh. I just want to thank you so much for coming on my podcast today. And, uh, and 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 enlightening everyone about how they can be more enlightened. I loved every minute of it, and thank you for this deep connection. Thank you, thank you. Thanks for listening to this episode of the Psychology Podcast. If you'd like to react in some way to something you heard, I encourage you to join in the discussion at thepsychologypodcast.com or on our YouTube page, The Psychology Podcast. We also put up some videos of some episodes on our YouTube page as well, so you'll want to check that out. Thanks for being such a great supporter of the show, and tune in next time for more on the mind, brain, behavior, and creativity.